Book 2. How to Trade. The greatest achievement was at first, and for a time a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn. The bird waits in the egg. And in the highest vision of the soul a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. Alan. Have a well-defined plan before you start trading. Then follow the plan. As the architect does in building a house, or the engineer in constructing a bridge or driving a tunnel. The man who changes his ideas or his plans, which are based on something practical, for no other reason than that he hopes or fears the market will do something different, will never make a success. Don't guess or follow tips. Very few people from the inside ever give out good information. Have a reason for every trade. Don't trade on hope. If that is the only reason or excuse you have for holding a stock, get out quickly and you will save money. Conditions change and you must learn to change your mind. First find out if a rule is practical, if it is based on sound reasoning. Go back over past records and convince yourself that it pays to use it. The valuable part of the rules that I have laid down of the theory that I am teaching is that it can all be proved. You do not have to accept my word for it. Look up the records, examine the facts and satisfy yourself. Chapter 8. Rules for Successful Trading If you cannot follow a rule, do not begin speculating or investing, as you are sure to lose. Learn to adhere strictly to a rule, or do not follow it at all. The following rules should be carefully studied and applied in your trading. First, capital required. You would not try to run an automobile and start out to travel several hundred miles unless you knew how much gasoline it required to run a given number of miles. Yet, you go into speculation without knowing one of the most important things, the amount of capital required to succeed and make speculation a business. Do not try to get rich in a few months or a year. A man certainly should be satisfied if he can acquire a competent fortune over a period of 10 to 20 years. Often, we have one year when a man with nerve and knowledge and a small amount of capital can make a fortune. I have been able to pile up enormous profits in a short time by pyramiding, but this cannot be done continuously, and I do not claim to be able to do it. What I am trying to teach you is a safe, sure way, which will yield more profits than any other business on earth if you will only be conservative and not make speculation a wild gamble. A man may go into business and lose all of his money and then years pass before he has another opportunity to make a large amount of money in that or any other business. Yet, in the speculative markets, opportunities return every year, provided a man has studied enough to see them when they appear. The chances for gain are so unusual and so many great opportunities do come in Wall Street that the average man gets greedy, gambles and does not wait between times for the real opportunity. People expect more profits in speculation than in any other business. A man who would be satisfied with a return of 25% per year in a business is not satisfied if he doubles his capital every month in Wall Street. Many people are satisfied with 4% in a savings bank. But when they come to Wall Street and put up $1,000.00, they expect to make $1,000.00 in two or three weeks. They are the people who buy on a 10-point margin and always lose. Do not expect the impossible in speculative markets. Great and unusual opportunities, when you can start at the bottom or top of a move, pyramid, and make a fortune, occur every few years, two or three times each year. When stocks are at the extreme high or low, there are opportunities for making 10 to 40 points profit. You may think an average of one half point a day, or three points a week, is too small a profit to bother with. Yet, in 52 weeks it would amount to 156 points, or $1,560 a year, on a 10-share trade. Make speculation a business, not a gamble. Go into it to stay, not to gamble all on a few trades, lose and quit. Be patient. If you can double $1,000 the first year and keep doubling it for 10 years, you would have over a million dollars. Active leading stocks make major moves of 10 to 40 points, three to four times a year. If you are able to catch half of these major moves on conservative trades, your profits will be enormous. Do not try to catch all the minor fluctuations. 
the inside manipulators themselves do not get one-tenth of the minor fluctuations. Why should you expect to? In beginning to trade in stocks, the most important thing to know is the amount of capital required. Many traders make the mistake of thinking that about 10 points margin is enough. Nothing is more erroneous. The man who starts trading on 10 points margin is gambling, not even making safe, speculative ventures. When you start to trade, use your capital as you would in a business, and in such a conservative way that you can continue. For trading in stocks selling at $100 per share or over, you should have 5,000 for each 100 shares you trade in, 2,500 for trading in stocks selling over 50, 1,500 for stocks selling around 25, 1,000 for stocks selling at 10 to 15. This amount of capital is not to margin stocks and let them run against you 10 to 30 points. It is to be used to make a large number of trades and pay small losses when they occur. You should always limit your loss on each trade to about three points and never more than five points. If you have only $300 to start trading with, when you buy or sell a stock, place a three point stop loss order on it. This will allow you to make 10 trades on your capital. Suppose you make five consecutive trades and lose, your capital will be half gone. But if on the next trade you are right and make 15 points profit, you will regain all of your losses. Or if you make three trades with five points profit, they would wipe out the losses of five trades with three point losses on each. Second, limit your risk. A strong will power is just as essential as plenty of capital. If you have not the firmness, will power, and determination to protect every trade with a stop loss order, do not start trading, for you will fail. I have often heard traders say, if I place a stop loss order at a certain point, the market is sure to catch it. Yet they realize afterward that the stop loss order being caught was the best thing that could happen to them. There is nothing better than getting out quickly when you are wrong. The man who refuses to get out when he is wrong usually stays until his money is gone and the margin clerk sells him out. A lot of people do not know how to place a stop loss order on a trade when they make it. A stop loss order is an order given to the broker that becomes a market order when the stock reaches the price at which it is placed. For example, 31. We will assume that you buy 100 shares of US Steel at 106. You feel that two points is enough to risk on the trade and that if it declines to 104, you would sell it out. It is not necessary for you to sit in a broker's office and watch the ticker until Steel declines to 104 and then get up and tell the broker to sell 100 Steel at the market. When you buy the stock, simply give your broker an order reading as follows. Sell 100 US steel at 104 stop GTC, which means good till cancelled. Now, suppose that steel declines to 104. When it reaches this price, your broker sells 100 at the market. He may get 104 for it, or he may get 10378 or 10334, but you know that when it reaches this price, your stock will be sold. A broker cannot guarantee to sell your stock at the limit of your stop loss order, but he does sell it immediately at the next best price after your stop loss order price is reached. Suppose that you sell US steel short at 106 instead of buying it, and that you want to protect yourself against loss. You give your broker an order to buy 100 US steel at 108 stop GTC. If it reaches this price, he buys in the stock. If your stop is not reached and the market goes in your favor, you must then cancel your stop loss order when you close out your trade with a profit. You can, of course, give a stop loss order good for one day, one week, or any specified length of time, but the best way to place the order is GTC. Then you do not have to worry about it. Third, overtrading, the greatest evil. Overtrading is the cause of more losses than anything else in Wall Street. The average man does not know how much capital is required to make a success, and he buys or sells more than he should. Therefore, he is forced to get out of the market when his capital is nearly exhausted and probably misses opportunities for making profits. Make up your mind how much loss you can afford before you make a trade, and not afterward. Stick to small quantities. Be conservative. Do not overtrade, especially at the bottom 
or top of long moves. Fortunes are lost trying to catch the last three to five points in extreme moves. Keep cool. Avoid getting overconfident at tops and bottoms. Study your charts carefully and do not allow your judgment to be influenced by hope or fear. Many a trader has started out trading in 10 shares and made a success because he started near top or bottom. Then when the market had reached extreme, he began trading in 100 share lots and lost all of his profits and capital too, because he violated the conservative principle which helped him to make a success. If you make one trade and it starts to go against you, you are wrong. Then why buy or sell more to average a loss? When things are getting worse, day by day in every way, why do your best to make them get worse in every way? Stop the loss before it is eternally too late. Every trader should remember that the weakest point of all is overtrading, and the next failing to place a stop loss order, and the third fatal mistake of all, averaging a loss. Eliminate these three mistakes and you will make a success. Cut short your losses, let your profits run, pyramid, or increase your buying or selling when the market is moving in your favor, not when it is going against you. Remember that wild, active markets are brought about by feverish manipulation, and that they increase the imagination, exaggerate your hopes, and take away all sense of reason and proportion. Therefore, in extreme markets try to keep a cool head. Remember that all things come to mend, and that a train going 6 miles an hour will cause a greater smash-up if it leaves the track than one travelling 5 miles an hour. Therefore, in a wild runaway market, jump before she bumps, for you will never be able to get out once the crash comes. When everybody wants to sell, and no one wants to buy, profits run into losses fast. The great bull market of 1919 shows plainly what happens when everybody gets crazy bullish and can see no top in sight. This bull market reached a point where everybody was bullish and buying, and no one on the outside dared to sell short. It was one of the fastest markets in history. And what happened? When the bubble busted in the early days of November and the decline started, some stocks were off 50 to 60 points in two weeks' time, and the profits made during the whole campaign that year were wiped out in 10 days. The man who waited for a rally to get out on after the move started down never had a chance, because everybody was trying to get out, and the further prices declined, the more people they were forced to sell out, with the result that the market got weaker as it declined lower. Fourth, never let a profit run into a loss. More traders are ruined by violating this rule than any other, except over trading. When you buy or sell a stock, and it shows you a profit of three to four points, what is the sense or reason for ever risking any more of your capital on it? Place a stop-loss order where you will get out even more better. Then you have all to win and nothing to lose. If the trade continues to move in your favor, you can follow it up with a stop-loss order. People often buy or sell a stock and it shows them a good profit. But they are hoggish, expect more, hold on and hope, and let it run into a loss, which is very poor business and the man who follows it will not succeed in the end. Always protect your principle in every way possible. Fifth, don't buck the trend. The way to make money is to determine the trend and then follow it. When you are in a bear market and the long trend is down, it is always much safer to wait for rallies and sell short than to buy. If you are in a big bear market where stocks are going to break from 50 to 200 points, you can miss the bottom several times on the way down and lose all of your capital. The same applies to a bull market. You should never sell short on an advancing market. It is better to wait for reactions and buy than to try to pick tops for selling. Big profits are made by going with the trend and not against it. One of the most vital and important things for either an investor or a trader to learn is to take a loss and take it quickly. When you see that you are wrong, there is no use putting up more margin and holding on hoping. If you take a small loss quickly and get out of the market, your judgment will be much better and you can see an opportunity to get in again and make profits. 6. When in doubt get out. When you buy or sell a stock and it does not act right immediately or start to move in your favor within a reasonable length of time, get out of it. Your judgment gets worse the longer you hold on and hope for the market to go your way 
and at extremes you always do the wrong thing. It is much better to take a quick loss of two, three, or five points than to hold on and hope and eventually take anywhere from a 10 to a 50 point loss. Stocks are not going to stop going up or down once they start just for your benefit. Always remember what Jim Keen said. If stocks won't go your way, you must go their way. Always go with the tide, never bucket. If you were on a railroad track and saw a train coming at six miles an hour, would you stand there and hope that the train would stop before it hit you? Or would you hope that maybe you could knock it off the track? Of course, you wouldn't. You would get out of the way and do it quick. You should do the same thing in the stock market. Get out. Let them go by or get aboard and ride with them. Seventh, trade in active stocks. Always confine your trading to standard, active stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Outside stocks have spurts, but the active leaders yield more profits in the long run. Stocks traded in on the New York Stock Exchange always have a good market, and you can get in and out when you want to. 90% of the unlisted and curved stocks disappear sooner or later. Leave the pups, cats and dogs, and mining stocks alone. The same group of stocks over a long period of time do not remain leaders. Changing conditions in the country cause certain groups to lead for a time, then become laggards, while new groups become public favorites and leaders. Here's the same thing with individual stocks of the different groups. As a rule, a stock that becomes a favorite and a leader will continue active anywhere from five to 10 years. After this period of time, it will pass into the hands of investors and its activity will cease. Fluctuations will become narrow because investors do not jump in and out every day. They hold for a long time. And finally, when they do start to sell out for some good reason or bet scared, then the old time leaders become active on the downside until liquidation has been completed. Of course, the big money is always made in trading in stocks that fluctuate over a wide range. For this reason, you must always be on the lookout for a new leader that will give opportunities for making big profits. Be up to date, keep up with the new stocks as they are listed, watch their development, and you will be able to pick the new live leaders and discard the old, inactive stocks. Big money is made, not from dividends, but from fluctuations, if you know how to trade quickly. That is why it pays to trade in active stocks that make a wide range. If you have to take a loss in stocks of this kind, you can make it back very quickly because opportunities occur often. Eighth, equal distribution of risk. There is an old saying, never put all of your eggs in one basket. And in the stock market, it is a very good rule to follow. If you are in position to do so, select as many as four or five stocks, one from each of the different groups buy or sell in equal amounts. Divide your capital up so that you can make seven to 10 trades with it. Suppose you have $5,000. Trade in 100 share lots and limit risks to three to five points. You would be able to stand five or six consecutive losses and still have capital to work with. By letting your profits run one big profit will often wipe out four or five small losses. But if you take big losses and small profits, you have no chance of gaining in the end. If you can only trade in 50 shares, take 10 shares each of five different stocks. Place stop loss orders on these trades from three to five points away. According to the indications on the stocks you are trading in, two of these stocks may go against you and catch your stop, while the other three may not. This will leave you part of your holdings, and if they move in your favor, will make back your losses on the others and show profits. If you get into the market right, and with the reason, records show that it very seldom occurs that you would get the stops caught on all of your stocks. You may not always make as much profit as you would to trade in one or two of the active, fast-moving stocks, but you will be safer. That is my aim, to teach you safety, help you protect yourself and cut short your losses in every possible way and let your profits run. Ninth, fixing a price or point to buy or sell. The majority of people have a habit when they buy or sell a stock of fixing in their minds a certain figure at which they expect to take profits. There is no reason or cause for this. It is simply a bad habit based on hope. When you make a trade, your object should be to make profits 
and there is no way that you can determine in advance how much profits you can expect on any one particular trade. The market itself determines the amount of your profit, and the thing that you must do is to be ready to get out and accept a profit whenever the trend changes and not before. Remember the market is not going to act to please you or go to certain figures just because you want to buy or sell at those figures. Many traders lose big profits by fixing the price at which they intend to sell. Stocks sometimes go within two, three or four points of their selling price and start to decline. They hold on and hope. Just because it does not reach the point that they have fixed in their minds, they often hold on and hope until they lose all the profits and take a loss, refusing to see that the trend has changed. Hope will ruin any man who follows it in the stock market. To succeed you must face facts, and facts are often cold and stubborn and do not agree with your hope. But you must accept them for your own good. In nearly every bull or bear campaign in the market the general public gets certain fixed points in their heads where stocks are going to make tops or bottoms. The newspapers talk about certain favorite stocks going to 100, 125, 150 or 175. Everybody gets the idea that these prices are going to be made and they become hope prices but are never realized. To illustrate this, during the fall of 1909, when the bull campaign in stocks was at its height and Steel Common had advanced to around 90, the newspapers began to talk of 100 for little steel. The public all got the idea in their heads that steel was sure to make 100, and that was the place they were going to sell and take profits. The writer predicted that steel would advance to 94 7 8 and no higher, which it did, and he sold out, while the hope crowd held on eventually to pluses, for US steel declined eventually to 38. Several years later, when it did reach 100, it was the place to buy and not to sell, for it immediately advanced to 129 3 fourths. The man who tries to get the last point or the top or bottom eight generally loses all his profits. You do not have to get in at the bottom and out at the top to make big money. All you have to do is to look over the list of the active leading stocks and you will find that they make moves from 50 to 150 points between bottom and top every few years. Then, if you can get in after the stock has advanced 10 points from the bottom and sell out within 10 points of the top, you certainly will be able to accumulate plenty of profits. Never get the idea in your head that you can or will hold a stock until it goes your way. This is nothing but pure stubbornness and is not based on any sound logic or reasoning. In case of doubt, get out. Do not hesitate. Delays are always dangerous. Do as the insiders do. If they cannot get what they want, they take what they can get. If the market will not take what they have to offer, they offer what it will take. If the market will not go their way, they go its way. A wise man changes his mind, a fool never. Tenth, when to take profits. Never close a trade just because you have a profit. The time to hold on is when the tide is running in your favor. When tempted to close a trade just because you have a profit, ask yourself the questions. Do I need the money? Is the move over? Do I have to sell? Why should I take profits? Look at your charts. Do what they tell you. If they do not show a change in trends, wait. Protect profits with stop loss orders, but do not take a profit too soon. This is just as bad as taking a loss too late. Patience to hold on when you are right and nerve to get out quickly when you are wrong will make a success. 11th, accumulate a surplus. A surplus must be accumulated before you increase your trading quantities. Margins are not to hold on with. Only lambs do that. If big risks are required, do not make the trade. Wait for an opportunity when you can buy or sell and place the stop loss order three to five points away. It is financial suicide to take big losses when they can be prevented. You must not expand until after you have made profits. Every important business concern carefully creates a surplus and is proud to publish it. No business is run without a loss at some time and a speculator or investor must expect losses. Therefore, he must create a surplus out of which he can pay losses and still continue to trade. In very active markets, when trading in high-priced stocks, 
As a rule, it does not pay to take a loss amounting to more than two consecutive days' fluctuations. If stocks go against you two days, they are likely to go more. Take your loss out of your surplus and leave your capital unimpaired and wait for another opportunity. 12. Buying for dividends. A great many people make the mistake of always wanting to buy stocks that will pay dividends. Do not buy stocks just because they pay dividends, nor sell them because they do not. Often people hold stocks because they continue to pay big dividends, only to see their capital half or more wiped out. Then the dividend is cut or passed altogether. Look to the protection of your capital, not for dividend returns. Trade for points of profit, not dividends. Fluctuations yield more money than dividends, and you will be able to tell when stocks are being accumulated or distributed for an advance or a decline. If a stock is selling very low or out of line according to the dividend it pays, there is probably something wrong, and it is a better short sale than a purchase. If a stock is selling very high and pays no dividend, there is a reason for it, and you should not sell it short. Probably it is going to pay a dividend or it is in a very strong position. Otherwise, it would not be selling at a high price. Manipulation for a time will force stocks above or below their intrinsic value, but then the end supply and demand govern the course of prices and values are based on these factors. I intend to teach you how to tell when supply and demand show the place where you should buy or sell. The word dividend means a division of profits or earnings, but often when you buy curb or mining stocks, the word means divvy, or that you divide up your capital with the other fellow and later lose all. Chapter 9 Methods of Operating After you have learned the rules for successful trading, it is then necessary to determine the best methods for operating either on the buying or selling side. All of these factors help you to overcome the weak points and enable you to make a better success. Buying outright Many people think that the only safe and sure way to make money on stocks is by buying outright. This is a sad mistake and has caused many a trader to come to grief. Study the records of past movements and you will find ample proof of my statement. You need only to refer to the great depressions that have occurred during the past 40 or 50 years to prove that it can cost the entire amount of the price you pay when buying outright, i.e. stocks will not only go down to nothing, but they can be assessed. How many people have you heard say, I own my stocks outright. I have nothing to worry about. They're not just the people who should worry. Every year many stocks go out of existence or are assessed. How do people know that they have the one safe, good stock on the list? At present there are about 700 stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange. In 5 or 10 years from this time, conditions may so change that over 25% of these stocks will be worthless or have declined enough to ruin any man who buys them outright and holds them. You must have something better than buying outright to protect you in order to make money. It is just as safe to trade on conservative margin, and you will make much greater profits when you know the right stock to buy or sell, and the right time. In the boom, which culminated in the fall of 1919, many stocks had advanced in nine months from 25 to over 100 points. Suppose people bought any of these stocks outright within 20 to 50 points of the top and held them through the decline of 1920 and 1921. Some stocks declined 100 to 180 points. There were no exceptions. All stocks suffered tremendous losses and many of them will never sell again at the prices they'd reached in 1919. The man who sold stocks short in 1919 and played the short side in 1920 and 1921 until the summer of 1921 was the man who made the money. Below, I give you the high prices of some stocks in 1919 and the low prices in 1921, which will prove to you what can happen to a man who buys stocks outright. Refer to table one in link provided. One. Most all of the above stocks were still paying dividends when they had declined 25 to 50 points from the top, and they no doubt looked attractive to a lot of people who bought them either on margin or outright. How many men will have the nerve to hold on when they see their capital shrink from 50 to 75%? Very few of them, and a man would be a fool if he did. This is another proof that you must place a stop-loss order for your protection. Because when a stock starts to go against you, 
It certainly can go enough to cost you all of your margin, exhaust your patience, causing you to sell out, probably just at a time when you should buy. I have not picked 1919 as an exception of a bull market or 1920 and 1921 as exceptional bear years, because they are not. These same kinds of declines have occurred in 1857, 1873, 1893, 1896, 1903, 1904, 1907, 1910, 1914, and 1917, and they certainly will occur again. Therefore be a bear in a bear market, and a bull in a bull market. Don't forget the fact that when stocks start to go against you, they can go a long way in either direction, and that the man who buys outright near the top, and thinks he is safe, or the man who sells short near the bottom, and puts up 50 points margin, and thinks it is enough, can both be wiped out. You might argue that a man who buys outright in panic years near the bottom is perfectly safe and doing the right thing. My answer is that the man who buys on margin at the bottom of the panic is just as safe and can make more money because he can carry more stock, and I intend to teach you how to tell when stocks reach top or bottom. Selling short. I'm not going to tell you that it pays to sell short. I'm going to prove it to you by indisputable records covering over 30 years of market movements. A lot of people trade in the market for years and never seem to realize that there are two sides to it. I have often heard people remark when stocks were declining fast, I cannot sell short. The man who is a born bull, chronic to the core, will never succeed. Neither will a chronic bear succeed any better. You must have no sentiment in the way you make money in the market. Your aim and object should be to make profits, and you should have no choice of how you make them, whether it be on the buying or selling side. The royal road to success is to be a bear in a bear market and a bull in a bull market. If you only trade on the bull side of the market, you have 50% more against you than if you trade on both sides. What chance has a bull in bear years or years of panic and depression? He may buy near the bottom of a break, but unless he grabs profits quick, he will soon have losses, while the bear who sells stocks short on every rally. Study the charts and convince yourself that at the right time, there is just as much money on the short side as there it is on the long side. Then make up your mind, if you expect to succeed, that you will sell short when conditions warrant. Your friends, brokers, and the newspapers tell you that it is dangerous to sell short, that there might be a corner. The chances for a corner in a stock are about one in a thousand. There have been only two important corners in the last 30 years. Northern Pacific was cornered in 1901, when it went from 150 to 1,000 per share. Stutz Motors was cornered in 1920 and advanced from around 200 to around 700. Stocks are made to sell, and the insiders sell them near the tops just as fast as they can. You are always safe in doing what the insiders do. Stocks with large capitalization are perfectly safe to sell short, because there is a large floating supply of stock, and it is impossible to corner them. The newspapers tell you what the insiders want you to know, not what you need to know. Watch the newspapers. When things are the worst, and it is time to buy stocks, they never tell you anything about the good times that are coming, but when stocks are top, and the insiders want to unload all they bought at the bottom. The newspapers tell you about dividends, extra dividends, melons, rights, and large earnings, when they should tell you that you are picking lemons and are getting wrongs, not rights, on your stock. A wise man does not expect something good for nothing, and only fools expect the fellow who is on the inside of the game, playing against them, to tell them what he is doing. The sentiment among brokers is always bullish near the top, and bearish near the bottom. The average broker knows no more about the market than you do, and there is no reason why he should. His business is to buy and sell stocks for commissions. That is the way he makes his money, and a broker who does this well earns all you pay him. His business is too confusing. He hears too much on both sides of the market to make his judgment any good, covers them on the breaks and waits for rallies to sell again, is sure to pile up big profits because he is going with a trend, which you must always do. In December 1920, when stocks were declining rapidly on two million share days, 
The newspapers told you about high money, frozen credits, depression in business, unemployment, buying power reduced, people unable to buy luxuries, automobiles, etc. At this time Studebaker sold at 37 3 fourths, which was the bottom. It steadily advanced, and not much was said about it until it got above 100. Now, for several months past, every few days the newspapers tell you about the wonderful earnings of Studebaker. Tips are all around Wall Street that Studebaker is going to 175 or 200 a share. Why tell the outsider all this good news now after Studebaker is up nearly 100 points? And what will be the story told to the suckers who buy the stock at present levels? When it again sells down around 50 or 60, which it will in the latter part of 1923 or 1924. It is the writer's opinion that the man who sells Studebaker and pays the dividend for the next year will make more money than the people who buy it and get the dividends. This applies to other stocks as well as Studebaker. Pyramid in Profits Many a trader has begun at the bottom of a bull market to trade conservatively and accumulated a large amount of profits. Finally, he begins to pyramid too heavily and too fast near the top, with the result that when the trend turns, he gets caught overloaded and loses all the profits he has made, and probably a lot of his capital. Sad experience has taught me that it is better to be safe than sorry. In speculation, let safety first be your motto. In trading, your first risk should be your greatest. Suppose on your first trade you risk five points, which if lost, comes out of your capital. We will assume that the stock moves five points in your favor. You can then buy a second lot and place a stop loss order five points away. And if it is caught, you will still lose only five points because you will be even on your first trade. Pyramid in all depends on where you get in on a stock, whether near the bottom when a move starts upward or near the top when it starts downward. On active stocks, as a rule, it is safe to pyramid every 10 points up or down. But you should decrease your trades and never increase them. Suppose your first trade is 100 shares and the market advances 10 points. Then you buy 50 shares and it advances 10 points more. You buy 30 shares and it advances 10 points more. You buy 20 shares and it advances 10 points more. And you buy 10 shares. After that every 10 points up you buy 10 shares more. In this way, if you follow up with a stop loss order, your profits will always increase while your risk will decrease. Your last trade may show a loss of three to five points according to how you get out on stop loss orders. But all of your other trades will show big profits. It is always safer to pyramid after a stock moves out of accumulation or distribution zones. Learn to adhere strictly to a rule or do not follow it at all. One thing you must not overlook, that every time a stock moves in your favor five or 10 points, the chances against it moving further in your favor have decreased. This does not mean that the stock will not go a long way in your favor, but it is the percentage against you that must not be overlooked. Buying and selling on a scale. Many investors and traders have the idea that the only successful way to trade is to buy or sell on a scale up or down. I have never yet seen a scale method that would beat the market. Someone asked Russell Sage if he believed in buying on a scale. He said that there were only three men who had money enough to buy on a scale. Carnegie, Morgan and Rockefeller. And they had more sense than to do it. A scale method will not work for the reason that you add to your holdings when the market is going against you, thus increasing your risk. If the market is going against you on the first trade and it looks like you are in wrong, the thing to do is to get out quickly and not buy or sell more. The time to take additional risk is when the market is moving in your favor, as shown in my pyramid in plan. It is all right to buy or sell more if you are doing it when you are making profits. But when you are trying to average, with losses piling up against you, you are sure to make a serious mistake, which will sooner or later cost all of your capital. Hedging in stocks. Traders who buy a stock of one group and it starts to move against them figure that they can even up by hedging or selling something short in another group. This very seldom pays. It is much better to take a loss and take it quickly on the trade that is going against you and start a new deal. There are some instances 
or have been in the past, where rails and industrials spread apart and then come together again. But to make a play of this kind requires a long period of time. For example, in November 1919, when 20 industrial stocks were selling on an average of 119, the Dow Jones 20 rails were selling at 8 to 2, industrials being 37 points higher than the rails. The writer figured that the industrials would sell lower than the rails within two years, which they did. In August 1921, the rails were selling at 70 and the industrials at 6 to 6, the rails being four points higher than the industrials, or a difference of 41 points in favor of the rails in 21 months. Of course, a trader who sold the high-priced industrial stocks short and bought rails, even at the top in 1919, would have made money. But this is not the way to trade, for the rails declined about 18 points, while industrials were declining 5 to 5 points. Therefore, the proper way to trade would have been to keep short of industrials as long as the trend was down, and not do any hedging. The great fundamental rule that you must learn in order to be a success is to follow the trend of the market. If you cannot determine a definite trend, get out and wait until you can. You can always make plenty of money after the trend is well defined. Failure to follow rules. The long swings in the stock market last on an average of two years, or approximately 600 market days. If you stand at the ticker and watch the fluctuations, it will make you change your mind 1,200 times in two years. 90% of the time you will be wrong because you are not changing your mind for any good sound reason, but simply because a minor move, which may last but a few hours or a few days, has changed the appearance of the position of the stock to the man who views it from short range, standing over the ticker. Every time you change your mind and change your position, you increase the percentage against you, because you are paying taxes, interest and commission. If you get in wrong, the ticker will keep you wrong, because it will make some minor moves every few hours or every few days that will renew your hope and keep you in. On the other hand, if you are in right and are watching the ticker daily, some of these minor moves that mean nothing will get you out and you will lose a good position. Then you must realize that you have very little chance to make any money watching a ticker, changing your mind and being wrong 90% of the time. The stock take moves in mysterious ways the multitude to deceive because the public are influenced by their hopes and fears. They sell on fear and buy on hope, thus getting in or out near the top or bottom, while the man who trades on some well-defined plan buys when the public sells and sells when the public buys. The stock market does not beat you. You beat yourself by following your own weaknesses, by listening to the man who knows less than you know, by reading the newspapers, following the gossip of the street, all of which is put out to influence you in the wrong direction. When the average trader comes to Wall Street, he is looking for information. He asks the bootblack, what do you think of the market? He also inquires of the waiter in the hotels, the office boy, his broker, friends and strangers around the broker's office. I am conservative when I say that the average floating trader asks the opinion of 10 to 12 people every day, most of whom are all guessers and know no more about the market than he does. If their opinions agree with his, he considers it good information and follows it, and of course, loses money. If half of the people he talks to disagree with him, he probably does not act on his own judgment, and later finds that it was right. He says to himself, If I had only bought when I intended to, I would have made money. But I talked it over with the broker and the boys, and they convinced me that I was wrong. A wise man changes his mind, and a fool never. A wise man also investigates and then decides. A fool just decides. The man who is fixed in his opinions on stocks, either a born bull or bear, will never make any money. A man must always be of open mind, ready to change his mind and act quickly when he finds that there is a good reason to do so. In Wall Street, the man who does not change his mind will very shortly have no change to mind. I know of a trader now in Wall Street who is an old man, probably 80 years of age. He has made several small fortunes in his day, and some of his big profits were made when he got his stocks that moved quickly 50 to 100 points. After that, he would lose all of the money that he had made, trying to catch another move where he could make 50 to 100 points quickly. This man had been broke for several years prior, 
to 1915. When the Great War boom started, he got hold of a few hundred dollars capital and started buying stocks and pyramiding. He got in at the right time, on the right stocks, i.e., he bought near the bottom. Stocks began to advance, and he began to pyramid. He bought Baldwin below 50, Crucible Steel below 40, Beth Steel below 50, Studebaker below 60. He was fortunate enough to get into the real war babies. He was trading in odd lots in the beginning, and when the market reached top in the fall of 1915, he was carrying thousands of shares. His equity with the broker was over $200,000. I said to him, now is the time to turn your paper profits into cash. At that time, Baldwin showed him over 100 points profit, Crucible over 100 points and Beth Steele several hundred points profit on his original trades. But he had gotten so bullish and so full of hope that he thought everybody was crazy and that every stock on the list was going to be a Beth, Steele, and go up to 700. I remember one day in October 1915, when Baldwin advanced to 154, which was the top, and the market was very wild and excited. I said to him, now either sell out all of your stocks or protect your profits with close stop loss orders. He said, stocks haven't started to go up good yet, and he gave me an order to buy 500 more Baldwin. He said, I am going to sell Baldwin around 250, not 150. That afternoon Baldwin declined to 130 and all of his other stocks in proportion, but he held on and hoped. Stocks continued to go down, and in a few months, Baldwin was back around 100, and he was forced to sell out his big line of stocks, and his profits of 200,000 were reduced to where his account showed less than 10,000. Now, where is the mistake with this kind of trading? This man saw the opportunity at the right time. He bought small amounts of stocks at the right time, and he pyramided right, but he failed to get out at the right time. A profit is never a profit so long as it is on paper. It must be turned into cash. This man refused to see the market as it really was. He was so bullish that he could not believe a 20 or 30 point reaction showed that the trend had turned, at least temporarily. Once a man has a profit and protects it with a stop loss order, he knows that that much money is safe and he is sure to get it. But if he holds on and hopes and increases his buying at the top, he is sure to lose. This man, after making and losing money, again went broke in 1917, and as yet has not come back, because he is getting too old, and he is too hopeful. To this day, he will listen to the advice of any clerk in a broker's office, or, in fact, anyone around a brokerage office, who will tell him of a stock that is going up 100 points, and he will believe it. Why? Because he hopes to get in again on a stock that will go up 100 points or more, pyramid it, and make a fortune. If you tell him that you know of a stock that is sure to go up five or 10 points, he will pay no attention to you. He is not interested in making five or 10 points. He wants to make 100. Some people never learn by experience. This man has been trading ever since before the Civil War, and in over 50 years has not learned that abnormal markets, where prices advance over 50 to 100 points in a few months, occur only three or four times in a lifetime. He is expecting things to happen every year, which experience should have taught him are not likely to happen more than once in 20 years. He does not see that markets are normal most of the time and fluctuate in a normal way. Therefore, he does not reason right or do any sound thinking. He works on an exaggerated bump of hope and, of course, meets with disappointments and losses. You must always learn that normal profits must be accepted in normal markets, and in abnormal times you can try for abnormal profits, but protect your trades whether they show profits or not, with stop-loss orders, and be ready to change your mind when conditions change. Chapter 10 Charts and Their Use What you should know about a stock It is all well enough to know the history of a company. Whether it is old or new, its earnings over a long period of years, how long it has paid dividends and its future prospects. Also, whether it is overcapitalized or whether the capitalization is conservative or not. But all of the information that affects the future price of the stock is contained in its fluctuations, and you need nothing more than its record of prices. 
A lot of people say that charts are of no value in determining the future, that they simply represent past history. That is correct. They are records of the past, but the future is nothing but a repetition of the past. Every businessman goes on the past record of business in determining how to buy goods for the future. He can only judge by comparison with past records. We look up the record of a man, and if his past has been good, we judge that his future will be good. Charts are simply a picture, which show plainer than we can convey in words. The same thing could be told in words, but you grasp it quicker when you see it in chart form. You would recognize a man and his good or bad qualities quicker from seeing his photograph than from reading a description of him. I want no better authority on anything than the Bible, the thing that hath been. It is that which shall be, and that which is done, is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. This shows that history is but a repetition of the past, and that charts are the only guide we have of what stocks have done, and by which we may determine what they will do. If a machine instead of a human being made the market, then it might be different. But to those of us who know how to read the signs of what the manipulators are doing and of what they intend to do, charts and past records are of great value. Therefore, you should have a chart of monthly high and low prices as far back as you can get them. Then a chart of weekly high and low prices anywhere from 6 to 12 months back, and last a chart of daily high and low prices 30 to 60 days back. This will show you what the tape tells about the past, present, and future condition of the stock. If the indications are not clear, you will have to wait a little while until the tape shows which way the balance of power lies and whether supply or demand is equal, or one is overbalancing. Volume. Do not overlook the volume of sales, for this is what tells whether supply or demand is strong enough to move the stock up or down. Consider the daily, weekly, and monthly volume of sales according to the total amount of stock outstanding. For instance, if you look up U.S. Steel for the last three months of 1922, you will find that it was in a narrow range for several weeks and the total sales only 300,000 shares. You cannot expect any big movement will take place either way immediately. Why? Because there are 5 million shares of U.S. Steel, and 1 million or more shares must change hands before any big move will take place from any resistance level. The greater the volume of stock, the longer the time required to accumulate or distribute a line sufficient to cause a long swing move up or down. What volume tells? The volumes of sales on each individual stock show the percentage that is being bought and sold. That is why the tape and fluctuations tell the truth, provided you interpret the tape correctly. Certainly, a stock cannot be distributed or accumulated without a large volume of sales. Someone must buy and sell a large percent of the capital stock near bottom or top, in order to cause a big move in either direction. Therefore, study volume closely. The time required to sell a large amount of stock, the number of points which it moves up or down, while the volume of sales is accumulating. Suppose U.S. Steel has advanced 20 or 30 points, and it reaches a level where there are 200,000 shares in one day, but the stock only gains one point. The next day there are 200,000 shares, and it makes no gain. This is plain enough that at this point the supply of stock exceeds the demand, or at least that buyers are able to get all the stock they want without bidding prices up. In a case of this kind, the wise thing to do is to sell out, watch and wait. If all the stock at this level is absorbed after a reasonable length of time, and it moves up to new high prices, it will then, of course, indicate still higher. In a big bull market, when stocks reach the distributing zone, they will fluctuate over a wide range and the volume of sales will run several times the total at standing capital stock. For instance, in the latter part of 1919 and spring of 1920, Baldwin Loco, Sales ran from 300,000 to 500,000 shares per week, while the stock was fluctuating between 130 and 156. This was when distribution was taking place, and the public was full of hope and buying regardless of price. After that, a long decline started and Baldwin reacted to 6 to 2 3 8 during the week ending June 25, 1921. It was down 93 points from the high of 1919. During the last week of the decline, 
It went down from 70 to 6 to 2 3 8, over 7 points, and the total sales for the week were less than 110,000, which showed that liquidation had about run its course, and that there was very little stock pressing for sale. The amount of sales at this time in one week were about half of the capital stock, and probably about as much as the floating supply. While when the stock was nearly 100 points higher, the capital stock was changing hands about twice each week. After Baldwin reached the low level of 6238s in June 1921, notice it began to rally on small volume, which showed that there was not much stock for sale and that it did not require heavy buying to put it up. The supply of stock in the hands of the public having passed into strong hands, it was easy to start the advance in this stock, which continued until it reached 1042 in October 1922, where distribution again took place. This is how volume shows you when accumulation or distribution is taking place. Chapter 11. The Seven Zones of Activity The stock market can be divided into seven zones which determine the different stages of activity. There are three zones above normal and three below. The normal zone represents something near actual intrinsic value, as far as human judgment can be depended upon, and as far as the ticker take, can analyze it from supply and demand. The line marked normal we consider as a place where buying and selling is about equal and fluctuations are very narrow, there being no incentive or reason apparent for any wild speculation up or down. Either accumulation or distribution may take place around the normal zone. Investment stocks or gilt edge bonds may start downward from this zone, while speculative issues, which have prospects or exaggerated hopes of big earnings, may start up from this zone. The first zone above normal marks the period of quiet advancing prices, which attracts very little attention. This zone may last one month, three months, six months, or a year. According to the cycle, the market is passing through general conditions, because from normal to the third zone at one time may be reached in 12 months, and at another time may not be reached for five or ten years, viewing the market from a long swing standpoint. The second zone above normal marks a period of greater activity when pools begin marking up stocks. You will hear reports of better business and the public will become interested in the market and buy on a small scale. But most people will wait for a reaction back to zone one to buy. Of course, this reaction seldom ever comes. The third zone or highest above normal marks a period of distribution. In this zone, great activity takes place and extremely wide fluctuations. Stocks are very feverish. The public buy madly. Reports of big earnings come in. Dividends are increased and stock dividends declared. Everything is optimistic. Prominent men talk of the greatest prosperity ever known. Weeks and months go by and stocks continue to advance. Reactions are very small. People who wait for reactions become discouraged and buy at the market at any price. You hear of fortunes being made by the office boys, the bootblack, bookkeepers, sonographers. Everybody is rolling in wealth, and all of them are dreaming of fortunes yet to be made. Most of the fortunes that they are counting on, of course, is paper profits. They have not yet cashed in, and not 10% of them ever do cash in at this stage of the game. They get too full of hope to sell. This stage of the market occurred from August until the end of October 1919. Many of my readers know what happened to them. In this stage, for weeks and months, every few days stocks will open up anywhere from one to five points higher and keep on going up without much reaction. After this has happened and the end is near, although no one can see it, traders all go home some night, hopeful with the sky clear and not a sign of disturbing cloud, and come down next morning and find stocks opening off anywhere from one to five points. There may be no news out, or any reason at all for the decline. But the real cause of it is that the market has reached the stage where supply exceeds demand. Everybody has bought to full capacity, and there not being any large amount of buying orders in at the opening to support prices, they open off. This is your first sign of the end. Take warning. Get from under, for with this first lightning strike, you may know that the storm is gathering, and it behooves you to protect yourself. After this first sign of the end, stocks may go lower for a while and then rally up near the high points and hold for a time, but it is the warning that the saturation point, 
is about reached, and the wise man will get out in time. The history of the world shows that there never has been a time when there was a great demand for anything, whether it be a product of the mine, factory or farm, that sooner or later, a supply in excess of that demand did not develop. Just as soon as any business becomes profitable enough for a few men to make big money, enough people will get into it to cause overproduction and force prices down. This is but a natural law. It is caused by the weakness of human flesh, and it applies to the stock market the same as to any other business. When stock prices reach this third zone above normal, fluctuations are so wide and rapid that fortunes or big profits can be made very quickly. This attracts all classes of people to the market. They buy and continue to buy, and prices continue to rise until somebody from the inside, outside, top side or bottom side supplies the demand, and the whole crowd find themselves at the saturation point loaded with stocks, looking for a buyer, and he is not there. Then follows the deluge back to normal, and on down to the final and third stage below normal. The first zone below normal is marked by a quiet decline from high prices and what might be termed the first bad shakeout of the weak holders. A rally follows but stocks become dull on the rally because the supply is still greater than the demand and distribution is still going on. A lot of people who miss the market in the third stage above normal are wise enough to sell out in the first stage down, and professional traders, seeing that the bull market has terminated, go short of the market on every rally with the result that prices begin to work lower slowly. The second zone below normal. Liquidation increases, breaks become bigger and rallies smaller. Reports of falling off in business come to light and a more conservative spirit underlies general conditions. People are less hopeful, become more conservative and stop buying. The result is that the market is without much support and gradually works lower. The third and final zone below normal is exactly the opposite of the third zone above. It marks a period of panicky conditions, extreme pessimism. Investors lose confidence and start selling out. There is great excitement throughout the country and reports of poor business. Dividends are passed or reduced, and even the men who were optimistic at the top now begin to sound a word of caution and hint that things may get worse before they get better. The supply of stocks seems unlimited. Everybody is a seller. No one wants to buy. You hear people say that they are not worth the paper they are written on. They are talking about the same stocks that they bought 50 to 100 points higher. When this stage is reached, it is the time to cover shorts and buy stocks when nobody wants them. In this stage, it may be necessary to watch and wait for several months until you see that liquidation has been completed and that accumulation is taking place, as there is always plenty of time to buy after the quiet advance starts. Remember, it is always darkest just before dawn, and it is always brightest at noontime just before the sun starts to recede. Chapter 12 Habits of Stocks The stock market is driven by human energy, i.e. prices are made through buying and selling of human beings, and as human beings have certain habits, certainly the market or the individual stocks reveal the habits and methods of the men who make markets. You should become thoroughly acquainted with the stocks you trade in, and by studying them, you will learn their individual moves which are peculiar to themselves. This is caused, as I have explained elsewhere, by a certain group of men or pools that operate in a stock for a long number of years. Investigate and learn all you can about the stock that you trade in before you make a trade, not afterward. Study the number of points each individual stock makes in its moves up or down. Note carefully the volume of sales on which it culminates in major or minor moves. Note whether it makes it bottoms or tops by a very fast run up or by a slow creeping movement. Some stocks make sharp tops and bottoms, some make round tops, others make square tops, some make double tops and bottoms, some make triple tops and bottoms, while others only make the single or sharp top and bottom. By double or triple top, I mean a stock reaching a certain level, then having a big reaction and moving up to the same high level a second or third time, and vice versa. Tops and bottoms flat or sharp. Stocks are no different than human beings. They have their peculiar habits and moves. It is just as easy to tell what a stock will do by getting acquainted with it 
and watching its moves over a long period of time, as it is to tell what a human being will do under certain conditions after you have known him for many years. Remember that stock market movements are made by human beings. Therefore, they reflect what the human mind thinks and reveal the actions, desires, hopes, wishes, and aims of the men who manipulate special groups of stocks that they are interested in. Stocks do not all move alike. Some are leaders, others are laggards. Some are fast movers, some slow movers. The stocks that lead and reach top first make what we call on a chart flat tops. That is, they reach a level and remain there for several weeks or months, fluctuating up or down over a wide or narrow range according to the kind of a stock, but never getting much above the level where distribution started. These stocks, of course, are the first to lead a decline when a bear market starts. The stocks, which are late movers and start their advance after the general market, is about top, are rushed up fast and make what is known as a sharp top. They do not remain long at top levels, but decline quickly because the general market has already turned downward. And of course, the late mover, which is going against the trend, must naturally meet with greater selling pressure at high levels than the stock which is already down considerably from the top. Then the question might be asked, where does distribution take place in stocks that make sharp tops? They are distributed as they run up and are also sold on the way down. After making a sharp top, they usually break back 10, 20 or 30 points and then halt. At this level, most people think they are down too much to sell short and have reacted enough to be good purchases. Therefore, they buy them. In a case of this kind, distribution often takes place 20 or 30 points below the top in the late movers, while the stocks which lead the advance are distributed within 5 to 10 points of the top. The leaders make the same level many times, some stocks as much as 10 or 15 times, while the late mover is more of a volcanic eruption. It shoots up to the top and never makes the same high price the second time, because when the explosive buying power is over, it recedes quickly to a level that might be termed semi-normal. It is a quick recession from high temperature. Time required for distribution. The time required to distribute stocks depends upon the stock, the amount of shares outstanding, general conditions, and how well the stock is known or advertised among the public. For instance, in a market like 1919, when trading averaged 2 million shares per day for over 60 days, it would be easier to distribute a million shares of stock in 60 days when the public were all wild and madly bullish, buying everything in sight, than it would be to distribute them in one year's time in a normal market. When stocks reach a level where distribution is taking place, they make rapid moves up and down. There is a large volume of trading and both short selling and buying is taking place. People are attracted to the stock that makes fast moves up or down because there are great opportunities for making money. People once convinced about a thing remain convinced for a long time. For example, a stock moves from 120 to 157 or eight different times. That is, every time it comes down around 120, it rushes up again to 140 and 150. The public finally become convinced that every time it gets down around 120, it is a sure buy for quick profits. Now, eventually, after the stock has been thoroughly distributed, it declines to 120 and fails to rally. Everybody is long of it, holding on and hoping. It goes down 10, 30, 40, or 50 points, until investors and traders become disgusted, scared, and sell out. Some of the surest signs of distribution are fast moves up and down on large volume, increased dividends, stock dividends, and special privileges to stockholders which really is the bait that catches the sucker, and in the end, causes a big loss. Misjudging the time of accumulation or distribution. It requires different lengths of time in various stages of the market to accumulate or distribute stocks. A pool may form in the early part of the year and buy a large amount of stock, expecting a spring rise. The advance comes in April or May, and the pool sells out, distributing its line of stock to the public. A break occurs in June or July and the public gets scared and sells out the stocks they bought at the top. Then this same pool, or another one, buys back the stocks and another advance comes. 
This may go on for three or four different times with the stock being distributed at the different stages, which are only minor periods of distribution. And finally, when the extreme high or final zone of distribution is reached and everybody is so bullish, the stock is distributed for a long bear campaign. The same occurs on the way down. The market halts and holds at one level for some time, then rallies, where the bears put out a line of shorts and the stock continues downward, going through two or three different stages of liquidation before the final stage is reached where accumulation takes place for another big bull campaign. This is all fully shown on the chart SNOS 11 and 12, showing the different tops and bottoms on the averages of the railroad and industrial stocks. Bull or bear markets all move in sections of three to four waves up or down, individual stocks working out their high or low points according to their time factor and individual vibrations. See chart on industrial alcohol, which shows the different levels or sections on the way down. Each resistance level might have been considered a bottom, but it was only a temporary bottom, as it shows plainly that it failed to make higher tops on each succeeding rally. Many stocks will halt near the end of a bull or bear campaign and make a level which looks like accumulation or distribution and appears to be the final top or bottom. But if the public buy heavily or shorts all cover around a level of this kind, there may be built up, even at a very high or very low level, a weak long or short interest, which will cause a final drive making the final top or bottom, as the case may be. Often when stocks are nearing final top, professional shorts will put out a big line of short stocks. Then something will occur to cause them to get scared and start to cover, and their buying, together with public buying will force prices to level a little higher than previous tops, all of which is plainly shown on the charts NOS 11 and 12 on rails industrials. This rule is also fully explained in the example given in regard to retail stores and its bottom of December 1920, and the next bottom February and March 1921. Resistance levels. Before you start trading in any stock, get a chart on it for several years back, if you can. Study it closely. Note the levels at which bottoms and tops have been made. Find out where its previous resistance points have been made. Then you will be able to determine whether you are entering the market at a safe or dangerous level. Suppose in 1921 you wished to buy a railroad stock which paid a good dividend and had prospects of advancement. We will presume that you made up a chart on New York Central from 1896 to date. See chart number 5. Now read about New York Central on the chapter how to tell the stocks that are in the strongest position. Thus, you will see that by having a record of stocks, you get acquainted with their movements and are able to know whether you are buying near the top or bottom of a move. Suppose you make up a chart of a stock and find that it has advanced from $10 a share to $50 and is selling at 40. This would not be a safe place to buy because it is too close to the high price and too far away from the low price. Of course, this does not mean that many stocks which have reacted from 50 to 40 are not good purchases. I am merely giving you an example of a place of safety in buying or selling. No matter whether it is a small move or a large move, before you buy or sell, you should wait until the stock shows that it is meeting with resistance one way or the other. Always remember that you should have a reason for making a trade. Do not buy or sell on hope. That is pure gambling and gamblers always lose sooner or later. When to buy or sell after extreme tops or bottoms. The way to tell when to buy or sell after stocks are away from extreme tops or bottoms is to watch reactions and rallies. The average stock reacts 5 to 7 points, sometimes 10. Low price stocks, 2 to 3 points. Watch the time required to complete major or minor moves. In very active markets, stocks will seldom react more than 2 days or the third day they will sell higher, buy on the second day's reaction and stop three points. If stocks get dull or narrow near bottom or top, wait for activity, then buy or sell. After a stock has held below a top or bottom for two weeks or more, gets active and makes a new high or low, then buy or sell as soon as it gets active in new territory, getting in when the move starts. Many people see a stock start advancing and wait for a reaction on which to buy. The reaction does not come and they get left. Reactions 
cross currents, and reverse moves take place during the accumulation stage. When this is completed, and the stock moves up out of the accumulation zone, it does not react much. Why? Because the insiders have bought all of the stock that they want, and their next objective point is to move it up to the distributing level where they can start to sell. They do not come back to let you or anyone else get on once the move starts. He who hesitates in Wall Street is lost. Therefore, when you see a stock starting to move, if it is very active and the volume of sales large, do not wait, buy the market. The same rule applies to selling. When once a stock breaks out of the distribution zone, if you are long of it, sell out of the market in very short. There is no use holding on and hoping. The stock is not going to move back to a high level just to let you sell out. No more than the 20th century train will back up to the Grand Central Station to let one passenger get on after it is 20 miles out. You must get on when they holler all aboard or you are left, and this certainly applies to the stock market. Of course, you must study the stocks and be able to determine when these big moves start. As a rule, when accumulation or distribution is finished and the move is underway, you can make more money in one to two months' time while the run is on than you can trade for the narrow swings in six months' time. Narrow, fluctuations and dullness. Markets nearly always culminate at the top of bull movements with wide fluctuations and large volumes of sales, which may keep up over several months, finally culminating with several days of two to three million shares. When these signs come, take warning, for the end is near. Bear markets, which are very rapid and fast, also wind up with wide fluctuations and large volumes of sales. For instance, on December 22, 1920, stocks declined rapidly, and the volume of sales reached 3 million, which was the largest day of the year. The market had been declining for several weeks and the volume of sales had been running high. This was the final culmination from which a big rally started and many stocks have never sold lower than they sold on that date. For many years when sales of 2 to 3 million have occurred top or bottom, it has always marked the turning point one way or the other. When a stock or group of stocks on averages remains for a long time in a narrow range and the volume of sales is small, it is a sign that either distribution or accumulation has run its course and the market is getting ready to turn. After short weeks, months or years, watch which way the market turns and go with it. Averages. The range on railroad stocks in 1921 was only 11 points on averages. The market was down to 66 on averages against a high price of 138 in 1906. This was the shortest year's fluctuations since 1912 and indicated that liquidation had run its course because railroad stocks became very dead and inactive and everybody afraid to trade in them. Then the upward move started. In comparing the position of railroad stocks with industrial stocks, note on chart number one of yearly averages that both rails and industrials made extreme low prices in 1896. That industrials made a higher bottom in 1903 and a still higher bottom in the panic of 1907 and declined to the same level in the 1914 depression. In 1917 made a still higher level and in 1921 went only two points lower than the low of 1917. While railroad stocks declined below the level of every year except 1898. This shows that industrials were receiving better support and were in position to advance faster than rails. They have advanced 40 points on averages from the low point of 1921, while rails have advanced only 27 points. This is the way to compare the averages of different groups or individual stocks to determine the ones that are in the weakest or strongest position. Many stocks, when they reach low levels and accumulation is taking place, remain in a very narrow range for many months, but once they break out of this range, great activity develops and you should watch the trend and go with it. For example, Mexican Pete. In 1918 advanced to 98 in February, reacted to 90. Traded between 98 and 90 until May 1918, then advanced to 102, reacted to 91. Advanced to 102 again in June, then reacted to 96, advanced to 103 in July. Then in the month of August traded in a range from 100 to 102, 
only two points, which was the shortest month of fluctuations in its history. Therefore, they've had distributed to the public. While they may advance for a short time after they are first brought out, the man who buys and holds them is sure to have big losses, if not suffer the loss of his entire capital before he sees a profit. For example, U.S. Steel. In 1901, when the U.S. Steel Corporation was organized, the common stock, of which there was 5 million shares, was put on the market around 40. It advanced to 55, and in less than 60 days, on May 9th. When the Northern Pacific Corner occurred, it declined to 24. The highest it ever rallied after that was 48. It then slowly declined until it reached 858 in the spring of 1904. The stock traded between 10 and 12 per share for nearly a year. This was the time to buy because it showed that it had reached a level where the insiders were supporting it and taking back all the stock that they had sold in the 40s. The stock did not get above 50 until 1908. Therefore, the people who bought when it was first issued and held it had to wait seven years before they were even on it. Besides, over 7-5% to of their capital was wiped out when the stock was near the bottom, and it takes a man with a lot of nerve and a big bump of hope to hold a stock when it is that much against him. This is one of the few stocks that did come back and go higher after it was first distributed to the public. Hundreds of others are either assessed or go out of existence. Transcontinental Oil One more example of a stock that cost the public millions of dollars in 1919. Transcontinental Oil which was placed on the market around 45 in 1919, advanced to 62 in November of that year. Hundreds of people were induced to buy and were told that it would go to 100 or higher. It started on its long decline because the insiders had sold out to the public and there was no support to the stock. This short month of extreme dullness at the top of an advance showed that accumulation was taking place and that the insiders were simply waiting giving everybody an opportunity to sell all the stock they would and to encourage a big short interest before starting the big advance. Therefore, this showed that it was getting ready for a big move one way or the other. In September it reacted to 98, then advanced to 104, which was above all previous tops since January 1917. The advance continued with only small reactions, until the stock reached 194 in October 1918. It reacted to 104 to 6 and continued to make higher bottoms until it finally reached 264 in October 1919. Chapter 13. Different classes of stocks. Does it pay to buy new stocks? When companies are first organized and their stocks are listed on the Curb or New York Stock Exchange, they are held by the insiders or people who form the companies and sell stocks in order to carry on the business. In a little over 12 months, or in December 1920, it sold at six, which would wipe out 90% of the capital if a man bought it outright anywhere near the top. Make up a chart on this stock and study it. See how it looks at the top and how it looks at the bottom. After it sold at six in 1920, it advanced to 13 in April 1921, then declined to six in August 1921, the stock becoming very inactive, which showed that it had reached a level where the selling was over and somebody was buying it. It advanced to 12 in December 1921, which was one point lower than the high price of April, then declined again to 7 one half in March 1922, where it again became inactive and dull, showing that there was support and that the stock was thoroughly liquidated. This was the time to buy. The stock has since advanced to 20 in May 1922 and still shows upward trend. Transcontinental oil was not the exception. Almost every other new company which placed stock on the market in the boom of 1919 declined in the same way. Always bear in mind that new securities are floated in boom times when everybody wants to buy and they are put out at high prices so that they can be sold all the way down. Therefore, great caution should be used in buying new stocks and you should get out quickly when they start to decline and go short. Then, when you think stocks have reached bottom, wait and give them plenty of time to show whether the demand is strong enough to give them permanent support or whether they have reached temporary bottom, only to break out and go lower a few months later. When stocks reach top or bottom, 
you do not have to be in a great hurry to get in or out. As the insiders require a lot of time to accumulate all the stocks, they want near the bottom and require time to make a market to distribute them near the top. Buying all the season stocks. It takes time, sometimes several years, to distribute a large amount of stock and get it into the hands of investors who will hold and not sell out when it advances or declines. Therefore, the average stock is manipulated over a wide range for many years, varying anywhere from 5 to 10 years, until investors absorb it all. After that, if it is a fairly good company with established earnings, it will fluctuate over a narrow range, because the investors have it and there is no manipulation in it. But remember one thing that after a stock is in the hands of investors, there is no more money in it for the insiders until such a time as they can start a scare and get investors to sell out. This requires a long time, because investors who have confidence in a stock and who have held it for several years are slow to let go of it. As long as it pays dividends, they feel safe and hold on. Finally, when it reaches lower levels than it has been for a long time, heavier selling starts, and as there is no support of any consequence, the stock declines rapidly until it reaches a level where the wise manipulators are willing to buy it back again. This is why it is often safer to sell a stock short when it is down 50 points from the top than when it is only down 10, as all support has been withdrawn. Everybody wants to sell, and no one wants to buy. I can cite you hundreds of examples of this kind. A few will suffice. New Haven. This railroad had paid dividends of 4 to 10% for about 30 years. The stock was in the hands of investors, and it started to decline. When it was down from 280 to 200, it still paid dividends. Investors held on because they thought it was all right. Later, when it was selling at 150, in 1911, it was still paying 8% and investors were holding it because they felt that it was safe. It had paid dividends so long. But the insiders who were out of it and had been selling it short for many years knew that the time was coming when all the dividends would be passed. In 1913, the dividend was reduced to 5% and the stock declined to 66 on heavy liquidation. The highest it ever rallied after that was 89 in 1915, the entire dividend being passed in 1914. A lot of people who had held on and hoped did not sell out when the dividend was passed, but as the stock slowly worked to lower levels, they lost hope and sold the stock for what they could get, the result being that it declined to 12 in 1921. This shows that stocks are never so low, but that they can go lower and are never so high, but what they can go still high. How many people would sell New Haven short at 50 a share when they knew it had sold as high as 279? Yet, it was a safe short sale, all the way down to 12. When conditions change the price at which a stock has sold makes no difference, and you must play it as it is. Union Pacific the same thing applies to selling stocks short. A lot of people knowing that Union Pacific sold at 3 one half a share in 1896 and was assessed at $20 per share could not realize that it could be worth 50 per share in 1899. Therefore, they sold it short and went broke. In 10 years after it was assessed, it sold at 195 3 eighths and paid 10% dividends. It went to 219 in 1909. Therefore, people who could not forget the low prices at which the stock had sold and were not broad enough to see the changed conditions brought about by E. H. Harriman lost fortunes bucking the trend and selling it short whereas, if they had only gone with the trend instead of against it, they could have made a fortune. American Sugar Refining This was another stock which fluctuated wildly for many years until the stock was distributed and nearly all held by investors. Then it quieted down and remained in a narrow range for many years. In 1919 its dividend was increased to 10%, the highest paid for 20 years. Yet, in the big boom and extreme high prices for sugar, the stock failed to advance anywhere near the high prices at which it sold in 1898 to 1906, the years when it was being manipulated and distributed. In 1921, the entire dividend was passed, and the stock declined to 4 to 7 5 eighths. Of course, everybody knows how quickly the bottom fell out of the sugar market without warning. 
but you might ask how the investor would know when to sell out the stock to protect his investment. We will assume that there was no indication or warning for him to sell out in 1919 at high prices. But there must be some place when a stock starts down where it will reach a level that shows weakness and support withdrawn. In 1914, which was a panic year, the low price was 97. In 1915, low 99, one half. In 1916, low 104. 1917, another panic year, low 89, one eighth. 1918, low 98. 1919, low 111, one fourth. Notice that from 1914 to 1919, the stock was being supported around 97 and that in 1919 the low point was 111 one fourth. Now, in 1920, when the stock sold early in the year at 104 to 2, everything might have looked all right for it. But when it broke through 111, the point at which it was supported in 1919, and then declined below 98, the support in 1918, it certainly was warning enough that support had been withdrawn, and that an investor should sell out. He certainly had an opportunity to buy it back again, over 50 points lower if he wanted to. Therefore, you see that you must be careful about buying stocks when they are first listed and new, and must also be careful about buying them after they have passed into the hands of investors and have become stale after the company is many years old. The time to make money trading for fluctuations or points of profit is when stocks are in the distributing stage, which lasts anywhere from one to five years, sometimes longer. After that, you must look for new and more active stocks. Market movements are made by men, and they represent the activity and energy of human beings. A young boy is more active, moves faster than an old man, but he makes more mistakes, has more ups and downs. An old man, when once he starts downhill, an old age gets a grip on him, seldom ever rallies or comes up again. It is the same with old stocks. Therefore, always play the favorites, the leading active stocks, which have wide ranges of fluctuations and are traded in in large volume on the New York Stock Exchange. Selling low price stocks short. Always remember that every time somebody buys, someone else sells, and vice versa. Do not forget this fact, that there is just as much stock when prices are low as when they are high, and somebody always owns the existing capital stock of a company. For example, U.S. Steel. When steel sold at the lowest price in its history, 858 in May 1904, there were 5 million shares. Again, when it sold at the highest price in its history, 136 5 in May 1917, there were still 5 million shares. Somebody owned the 5 million shares when prices were the lowest, and somebody owned the 5 million shares when they were at the highest. It was the insiders who owned the stock at the bottom, and the outsiders who bought it at the top, because it was paying 17% dividend. While it was paying no dividend, it sold at the lowest. A large percentage of the public buy low price stocks for the reason that they think they will go down less and hope that because they are low, they can go up high. This, of course, is a false impression and not based on any sound fundamental principle. Most of the time, when stocks sell at low prices, they are not worth any more, probably less than they are selling for. When they sell at high prices, they are worth what they are selling for, or there is some reason or cause for the high level of quoted value. Certain low price stocks always become favorites of the public and they buy them, which enables the pools and insiders to sell them out. Then of course, they go down, because there is no support. The public having bought to capacity cannot buy any more. Prices decline. And finally the public, becoming disgusted, sell out near the bottom. You can always make big profits by selling short low price stocks that are favorites and in which there is a big long interest. For example, Southern Railway was a great favorite with traders throughout the South from 1901 to 1920. Every time this stock advanced above 30, they would become very bullish, hoping and expecting that it would advance to 50 or higher. A chart of it will show you that it was a good short sale every time the public bought it heavily. Erie is another stock that the public have always bought on hope, and there have often been big opportunities for selling it short at comparatively low levels, 
as it has always there is just as much stock when prices are low as when they are high, and somebody always owns the existing capital stock of a company. For example, declined until the public became disgusted and sold near the bottom. The percentage of declines in low-priced stocks is often greater than the declines in high-priced issues. Therefore, the medium low-priced stocks are safer short sales because they rally less buy in high-priced stocks. When a stock starts to advance, say from around 100, which is its normal level, it will meet with a lot of selling every 5 to 10 points up because people who think it is high enough and have profits sell out. If it continues to advance, most all of the public will sell out. Then the professionals and the public will decide that it is too high and start to sell short. They all look for a reaction, but it does not come. The stock continues to advance until it reaches a level where all the shorts have been so badly licked that they cover up and quit. A lot of people after seeing a stock advance from 100 to 200 become convinced that it is never going to stop going up and they buy. The result is that at a high level a week, long interest is built up and the short interest run in. And of course, the stock eventually starts on a long decline. Often people who believe a stock too high at 110 will think it cheap enough at 180 after it has reacted from 200. You can always make money buying high price stocks when everybody is getting out because they think they are high enough for a reaction. This is why stocks halt and react at low levels and then when they get to high levels, rush up fast and react very little because the stock has been absorbed and the selling pressure is no longer encountered. Of course, all stock must eventually reach a level where distribution will take place and supply exceed demand, as the only object of anyone buying stocks is to sell them again. The big money is made in the last stage of a bull market when prices are feverishly active, and the big profits on the short side are made in the last stage of a bear market when everybody wants to sell and nobody wants to buy. Stocks that are your enemies. Any trader who has followed the market for 10 years or more and has been an active trader, if he will carefully analyze his trading, will find that there were certain stocks which he was never able to make any profits in. He always seemed to get in too soon or too late. No matter if he sold them short or bought them, he always ended up with a loss, while other stocks always seemed to favor him, so much so that he would call them his pets. Now there must be some cause for this, as nothing just happens. Everything is the result of a cause. When you find that a stock does not seem to work well for you, leave it alone. Quit trading in it and stick to the ones that favor you. I could explain to you the cause for this, but it is not necessary, and many of you would not believe it. My own experience in trading and my analysis of the cause of effects enabled me to discover the reason for these things. For many years, Max Pete was one of my particular pets. I could always make money in it. My forecasts on it were so accurate that people all over the country who subscribed to my market letter called me the Max Pete specialist. I was able to catch its moves up and down over 90% of the time, just the same as if I had been making the fluctuations myself. Many other stocks work just as well as this for me, while others do not favor me, and I have never made any money out of them. It makes no difference whether you know or do not know the reason why a thing works or does not work. Just as soon as experience teaches you that there is something that works against you, the only thing to do is to quit. Chapter 14. How to read the tape correctly. The best way to read the tape correctly is to stay away from it. Get the records of the day's prices and the volume of sales. Make up your chart and judge it when you are not influenced by rumors, gossip or reports, or by the way the tape looks when it is making a move that only lasts 30 minutes or one hour. When final tops or bottoms are made, for a major or minor move, it will be plainly shown by the volume of sales and the time consumed at bottom or top before the move starts. A stock, in order to go up, must have reactions, but each succeeding bottom or top must be higher if the stock is going to continue upward, until it reaches a level where the selling is so strong, and the volume of stock offered so great that there is not enough demand to absorb it. Then a reaction will take place, and the stock decline to a level where the demand again exceeds the supply, and the trend will turn up. Studebaker. Notice the weekly chart number two on Studebaker, 
which runs from September 1920 to January 6, 1923. A decline started from 66 on September 25, 1920, and declined to 54 on October 2, then rallied to 59 in the week of October 9. For four weeks following this date, it made the same level of prices, failing to advance higher. This showed that the supply of stock was greater than the demand. A decline started on November 3, and by November 8 prices had broken below 54, the bottom made on October 2, which showed that the trend was again down. During the period from October 9 to November 6, when prices were fluctuating within the range of two or three points, and each week getting up around 59, the man watching the tape would have been fooled many times, because each time it made 59, it would look like it was going higher. And how could he tell but what the buying would be great enough to carry it through? The proper thing to do when a stock makes a level like this is to sell out and go short with a stop one to two points above the level. Then wait until supply or demand forces it higher or lower. In this case, the stock declined rapidly to 41 on November 20, then rallied to 48 the following week. After that each week made a lower top and a lower bottom. In the week ending December 25, 1920, the high of the stock was 41 3 fourths and the low 37 3 fourths. The volume was large, but the stock did not decline over two points below the previous week, and it closed near the top prices of the week, which was an indication that the buying was better than the selling. The following week it advanced to 45 1 half, which was higher than the two previous weeks, but resistance was met at 47 to 48. During the week ending January 8, 1921, it advanced through this level up to 52 and continued on up to 59. The resistance levels made in October and November 1920. Studebaker reacted from this resistance level again back to around 55, and during the week ending February 19, advanced through this level to 62, which showed that the trend had turned up again. And if you had sold out and gone short with stop at 60, you should have covered and gone long when it crossed this level. Note that for three weeks it held in a narrow range, but did not break back below 58. Then the advance was resumed, and by April 2 it had reached 80, which was above the last high price made. From this level, the stock reacted to 72, but the following week it received support at the higher level, and so on each week until the week ending April 30, 1921, when it advanced to 93, and the volume of sales was 359,760 shares. Again, the week ending May 7, it fluctuated from 92 one half to 87, with a volume of sales amounting to 227,300. Now note that from the bottom, which was made during the week ending December 25, 1920, at 37 three fourths, every rally was from a higher bottom which showed that the buying was better than the selling and that the stock had not yet reached a level where supply was greater than demand until it advanced to 93, where the large volume of sales showed that there was enough selling to check the advance. Note that the week beginning May 9, 1921, the stock opened at 86, breaking the levels of the two previous weeks where there was large volume. This was the first indication that the trend had reversed and that you should sell out and go short. This advance, which amounted to 55 points, lasted a little over four months, during which time the weekly chart shows that the trend never changed, but during this time, if you will go back over the tape, you will find dozens of times when you would have sold out and gone short and lost money. Why? Because a move that would run 30 minutes, three hours, or three days down, would fool you and make you think that the trend had changed. After the trend on Studebaker turned down, it declined sharply until it reached 70 the week of May 28, 1921. After that you will notice it held in a narrow range for three or four weeks, and only declined less than two points lower than this level, which showed that there was some support. Then it rallied to 82 one half the week ending July 9. After holding around this level for several weeks, which showed that it was again meeting with heavy selling, the trend turned down again and it declined to 64 3 fourths on August 25. Then followed a sharp rally to 79 on September 10, 
then five or six weeks of a slow decline down to 70, then six or seven weeks more of narrow trading in a range of about four points. Finally, the week ending December 10, 1921, it crossed the levels made on September 10, but again halted around 8 to 2, the levels made on July 9 to 16. Then the advance started. The long period of time and narrow range show that accumulation was taking place. The advance continued, resistance levels being raised until it reached 124 on half on April 22, 1922. Then followed a quick decline down to 114, one fourth from which it advanced to 125.78, being higher than the previous level. But the stock narrowed down and the volume was small. In the week ending June 17, the stock declined to 116.58, again getting a higher support than the last level of 114, one fourth made on May 13, 1922. Then increased volume and great activity started, and the stock advanced to 139.38 on July 19, 1922, where the volume during the last two weeks amounted to 400,000 shares. Besides, the volume on the advance from 116.58 up to 139.38 amounted to 1,600,000 shares, which was nearly three times the total capital stock outstanding and probably five or six times the floating supply of stock. This showed plainly that distribution was taking place, and that the public was buying this stock, and that the insiders were selling out. A decline started, and on August 12, 1922, it declined to 123, but the volume was only 110,000. The following week it fluctuated, in about a four-point range with a volume of only four to 6,000, which showed that the selling pressure was not yet great enough to bring about a big decline. It advanced to 134, and again declined to 123 three fourths on September 30, failing to go through the level made on August 12. After this, a rapid advance started, and in the week ending October 14, 1922, it advanced to 139.38, the same level made on July 19. The volume of sales was 205,000 shares this week, which was an indication that selling was taking place and that you should sell out and go short with a stop-loss order one or two points above the old level. The following week that volume of sales was 24,000 and the stock declined to 129. A plain indication that the selling was greater than the buying. The stock continued to work lower, but met with stubborn resistance around 123 to 122 where it held for two weeks. Finally, in the week ending November 25, 1922, it declined rapidly to 116 and on Monday, November 27, it declined to 114 one fourth, the same low level it made on the reaction May 13, 1922. Now the man who is simply standing at the ticker watching the tape would hardly remember that 114 one fourth was the low price made on May 13. Therefore the last point where support was given and from which it rallied to new high levels. But the man who had the record of the tape on a chart would certainly be watching this point. When it reached 114 one fourth large volume of sales appeared on the tape and it showed plainly that the support was there. This was the point to buy the stock protected with a stop-loss order, one to two points below the old resistance level of 114 one fourth. The stock rallied to 123 three fourths, the week ending December 2, 1922, and the volume of sales was 240,000 shares, which showed that the buying was better than the selling. Note that the two previous weeks the highest point was 125 one half. In the week beginning December 9, the stock was very active and the volume of trading large. A stock dividend of 25% was declared, and the stock advanced to 134 one fourth, the volume of sales being 500,000 shares for that week, which was the largest for any week since the stock sold at 37 three fourths in December 1920. This was plain evidence that the public was buying stock and that it was in the zone of excitement and great activity, which nearly always marks the end of the movement up or down. The advance continued, the stock reaching 141 three fourths, a new high level on December 27, 1922, which was just two days before it sold X stock dividend. 
the volume of sales for the week ending December 30 amounted to 240,000 shares. After the stock sold ex dividends, it declined to 110.38, then rallied to 119 on January 2, 1923, which would equal 148.34, counting the stock dividend at 25%. The total volume of sales between May 13, 1922, and December 30, 1922, amounted to over 7 million shares. The range of the stock was 114, 1 fourth to 141, 3 fourths. Now, this is where volume tells. Certainly, when the capital stock has changed hands 15 or 20 times in a range of 27 points, after this stock is up over 100 points, there is no question but what distribution is taking place and the stock is getting ready for a long decline. Therefore, instead of investors buying the stock because it pays 10% and has declared a 25% stock dividend, they should sell out and go short. Now, the question is to determine the position of the stock in January 1923. After it advanced to 119, it started to decline and short sales would be in order with a stop loss order at 120 to 121. The resistance level at 114 having been broken, the trend of the stock is down. And when it breaks 110, the price made on December 29, 1922, it will be in a weaker position and should be followed down until signs of support, both in volume and time, are shown. By time I mean that the stock must hold a resistance level for several weeks without breaking lower. The period of time required to distribute Studebaker was about eight months or from April to December 1922. Note the last period of accumulation when the stock sold around 65 and fluctuated between that price and 80, that the period of accumulation was about six months, or from June to December 1921, and that the stock advanced seven to six points from the low point made on August 25, 1921. And if you count the stock dividend, it advanced about eight to four points. The same rule and reasoning should be applied to any other stock that you wish to determine the trend of. During the period of accumulation or distribution, the man who tries to read the tape must get fooled dozens of times and make mistakes in trying to follow minor moves which do not mean anything. Therefore, the correct way to read the tape is to keep up a chart showing moves of from three days to one week and the amount of volume. Of course, you must consider the total outstanding stock and the floating supply. Again, I emphasize the fact that the correct way to read the tape and interpret it accurately is to stay away from it. Chapter 15. When the tape finishes and gives final signals. The truth that the tape has to tell you cannot be told in one day, in one week, or in one month. It begins to tell its story the first day that a stock reaches the buying or selling zone. But it requires time to complete the story, to assemble all of the facts, to finish the accumulation or distribution and give the final signal that a new move is on. Chart number three, showing US rubber at the top of 1919, is an important and valuable example of this. US rubber. When US rubber advanced to 138 in June 1919 and reacted back to 124, then rallied to around 138 again, holding until August around the same level it showed that selling pressure was sufficient to stop it. It declined to 111 in September, rallied again to 138 in October, made 139 in November, declined to 113 in November, receiving support two points higher than the September bottom, then rallied to 138 in December and in January 1920, advanced to 143 or five points above the high price made in June 1919. Now, making a new high would ordinarily be an indication that it was going higher. But after a stock advances into new territory, if it is going higher, it will continue on up without breaking back below the old top levels. In this case, US rubber, within a few days, declined to 136, which showed that heavy selling had been encountered, that the new high level was made at the expense of shorts and outside buying that the selling which started in June 1919 was still there and that someone was supplying the stock. A rapid decline followed in February 1920 and when the stock broke below 112, 
which was under the last support point. It was a signal that distribution had been completed and that a big downward move would take place. In the previous June 1919, after US rubber had advanced from 45 in December 1917, it showed that it had reached a level where heavy selling had commenced, but the tape could not tell when this selling would be completed, and all the stock distributed. But it did tell the final story in February 1920, when it broke under 112 and promptly declined to 92, and never rallied above 115 again until it sold at 41 in August 1921. All the way down the selling pressure was plainly indicated, and the stock continued to make lower tops and lower bottoms. The tape was telling part of its story all the time, but it did not show that it had finished until November 1921, when, after three months in a narrow range, the stock moved up into new high territory. Thus, you see that after any big advance or big decline, it requires time to tell when the next big mood is going to start. And the man who expects to read this from the tape, day by day, will get fooled many times. Therefore, he should wait until he gets a definite indication before deciding that the big trend has turned and a major move started. The larger the capital stock of the company, or the more shares outstanding, the longer it requires to complete accumulation or distribution. The length of time, as well as the total number of points that a stock has moved up or down from high or low levels, must be considered in judging whether accumulation or distribution is taking place. After US rubber was up 100 points from the low and had reacted from the same high level for eight months, and after the panicky decline in November 1919, had plainly shown that the bull market was over, you would not expect that US rubber making a new high was going to very much higher levels. But you should wait a few days to see whether the price could be maintained before burn short. The daily high and low, weekly high and low chart and the total volume of sales will help you to determine when a false move of this kind is made, and the trend reverses, because a move of this kind into new high territory causes all the shorts to cover and leaves the stock in a weak technical position. Time for accumulation and distribution. When a stock uses up several months' time, either in accumulation or distribution, it will require then several months for the run between accumulation and distribution. All of the stock is not sold on the first rally, nor even on the second or third. Stock has to be bought, and the market supported on the way up until it reaches a level where the supply is greater than the demand and the insiders are willing to sell out. Then it hesitates and moves up and down over a narrow or wide range, according to the kind of stock, until distribution is completed. The same occurs when a stock starts down. It requires a long time to convince people that after a stock has been selling at 140, it is going down 100 points. Some people buy when it is down 10 points, others buy on 30, 40 and 50 point reactions, believing the stock cheap because they remember the price at which it formerly sold, $140 with the result that when it continues downward, they all get scared and sell out, causing the last rapid decline which may be anywhere from 10 to 30 points. If people would only learn to watch and wait, they could make a lot more money, but they are in too big a hurry to get rich, and the result is they go broke. They buy or sell on hope, without a reason. End of part two. Thank you for listening to book two of Truth of the Stock Tape. More updates and books are coming soon. If you've enjoyed this audiobook, please subscribe.